Hi everyone. Uh, we are going to start in another three, four minutes. Uh, you all know why we are here, but just to give you a brief background, uh, this session today is about the part three or the section three of the paper that uh, Prashant and uh, 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 Malavika and Professor Subhashish Banerjee and Subodh Sharma at ID Delhi and uh, Dwara Research have written. And today's session will primarily focus on the computing principles and Prashant will be ideally explaining you the computer science principles behind privacy by design. And tomorrow's session is a essentially around the regulatory architecture and what would an example system would look like. And Prashant, I guess you can just start. I'll let people join in as they come in. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Srinivas. Uh, and welcome all of you to this uh, part one of this two part series. Um, so as Srinivas mentioned, uh, what I'll do is I'll give a broad overview of uh, various privacy concepts in computer science, uh, and uh, we'll try to understand the strengths and limitations of them. Um, and part two will basically focus on uh, an operational architecture, uh, which we have uh, explained in detail in the paper. Um, but this one is just uh, kind of a primer to part two. Um, so, right. so uh, the agenda today is that we want to um, first of all overview these privacy techniques in computer science and evaluate uh, how well they align with the legal principles of privacy. And this is by no means a comprehensive uh, detailed overview. Uh, privacy research is uh, almost four decades old um, now. Uh, there are dozens of journals, conferences, thousands of PhDs. Uh, so, uh, what we see here is uh, uh, naturally a very compressed version um, of the picture. Um, and you'll find uh, the details and references in this uh, link. Um, so before I go further, uh, I actually wanted to uh, make some clarifications regarding uh, some terminology. And I believe uh, this might have uh, led to some confusion. Uh, between the legal community and the CS community. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, the legal definitions, uh, you have informational privacy, which is uh, you know the broad concept of uh, individuals' uh, right to be left alone. Um, and this was the um, basis of uh, the Kutaswami judgment. Uh, and uh, traditionally, you think of data security as uh, um, various technical safeguards and operations uh, which uh, um, companies or organizations keep in place to make sure that the data is secure, meaning that there is no unauthorized access to data. And uh, uh, data protection is uh, kind of uh, above and beyond data security, uh, which talks about a general legal framework which achieves informational privacy and in addition to uh, data security, it also uh, talks about preventing uh, unlawful collection and processing by entities. And um, hopefully with this talk, I would uh, want to uh, convey that uh, modern uh, computer science techniques, many of them also talk about data protection. And uh, uh, traditionally, where um, cryptography and uh, security is just uh, thought to be related to you know, preventing unauthorized access to data, uh, just encryption uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, that is not the only focus um, of uh, modern cryptography, essentially. Uh, and um, we will see various techniques uh, which uh, explicitly talk about data protection and informational privacy and not just security. Um, so, um, before we go into um, computer science principles, um, let's first look at the legal principles. And this is, uh, these are called the OECD principles. They were established in 1980. And uh, I think uh, now they are uh, the de facto uh, principles to go by uh, in terms of privacy. 
So the first one uh, says collection limitation, uh, which uh, is uh, essentially a statement about consent that whatever data you collect, it should uh, occur with the knowledge and consent of the individual whose data you're collecting. Uh, the data quality principle says that uh, you should only collect data that is relevant and necessary for the task you are trying to do. So you should not collect irrelevant uh, data. Uh, purpose specification says that when you collect data, uh, the purpose for which you are collecting it should be specified. Uh, so you can't just collect uh, without specifying the purpose. Uh, and use limitation says that uh, this purpose specification should be respected. Um, and the rest are kind of self-explanatory. Uh, individual participation means that individuals need to be in control uh, to maybe update the data uh, or uh, um, control how it is shared. Security safeguards talks about uh, essentially the data security uh, aspects of it, that uh, all unauthorized accesses should be prevented. Openness talks about um, it should be open uh, and transparent how you are processing our data and what you are doing with it. And accountability talks about, uh, um, you know, if there is a breach, then uh, data controllers should be liable and they should be able to pinpoint who is accountable. And um, if you look at the um, privacy risks, uh, it's actually a leveled, uh, leveled um, approach that you have to uh, take. And uh, at the very bottom level, yeah, the risks are um, what you, you can call them as belonging to the data security domain. And that is that um, leakage of sensitive data while it is in transit and any unauthorized access of information, uh, that should be prevented. Uh, but if you go a level up, uh, you also start thinking that uh, Linkage of information which is shared across multiple databases, that should also be prevented. And this is why Aadhaar is uh, such a big issue because if you uh, start sharing, uh, start seeding everything with Aadhaar, then it means that all those databases could be linked together and um, you know your purpose may be violated from there. Then uh, even when you do some kind of anonymization, you don't collect Aadhaar or you just give anonymized data, there's also a risk of re-identification of individuals, even though you have not explicitly uh, identified them. And we will talk about this in detail. Um, and finally, uh, the problem with privacy is that post-access um, purpose violations are very hard to prevent. So which means that once you have given uh, the data to an authorized agent, then what is the guarantee that it will not be sold or it will not be used for some illegal surveillance or otherwise misused. And yeah, even when there is no uh, manual agent, uh, you can have purpose violation through AI. So uh, you can uh, have illegal profiling or targeting using AI. So all of these things kind of broadly cover uh, most of the privacy risks which uh, we will talk about today. So uh, I think um, before going further, uh, I just wanted to clarify the format I'll follow is that I'll introduce um, a concept uh, and then uh, we can have a discussion on it rather than having questions at the end. So I think that will make it more interactive. Um, so first talking about encryption. Uh, so encryption deals with, uh, you know, protecting data in storage and transit. So you have these two people, Alice and Bob, who want to communicate and uh, um, they want to make sure that nobody can peek in uh, what data is being sent in during transit, right? So Alice encrypts uh, the message M for Bob and uh, gets a cipher text. Um, and the idea is that uh, given this cipher text, it is very hard to find uh, the plain text message M. And this is uh, um, the general theme which, is, uh, which you'll see in any encryption mechanism. Uh, for example, in the RSA um, encryption system, uh, it depends on hardness of uh, um, factoring of composite numbers. So this has uh, actually uh, parallels with the physical analogy. If you want to 
protect something in the physical world you put it in a box and lock it now the security of this mechanism depends on the hardness of breaking the lock so similarly uh, in the digital world uh, the security depends on uh, hardness of some problem and you have uh, really two kinds of encryption the first is called the symmetric encryption and the second is called an asymmetric encryption uh, so in symmetric encryption uh, what uh, you need to do is that these two parties need to exchange some key k over uh, um, a secure channel so the secure channel is shown by this uh, bold arrows here uh, and once they share it uh, they share a, uh, a key uh, via some secure channel then they can uh, encrypt multiple messages using this key but this uh, first step needs to be done um, in some other way in uh, some offline fashion uh, and that is a problem really uh, how do you actually share keys securely in an unsecure environment uh, now asymmetric encryption or uh, this is also called a public key encryption that solves this problem uh, by uh, having entities uh, generate two keys not one key uh, one is called a public key and other is called a secret key uh, and the public key is shared freely essentially so this bob uh, can share his public key um, through the insecure channel um, there is no security risk involved there and the um, uh, encryption is done against this public key now the guarantee that you get is that um, anybody who knows the secret key corresponding to public key only that person can decrypt uh, the message uh, from the cipher text and if you don't know the secret key skb then you cannot decrypt uh, so this way uh, you avoid uh, having to share uh, a key via some secure channel uh, and that's why public key encryption became so popular so uh, so basically um, but this public key encryption is a little slow so um, what people usually do is that this first key exchange they do it uh, via the public key encryption mechanism and then the rest of the messages are uh, encrypted using the symmetric encryption uh, encrypted against the key shared in the first step right um so this is uh, this protects uh, you know data uh, in storage and transit but uh, when you are actually doing computation so when bob actually gets this data uh, gets it encrypted and then bob needs to run um, some algorithm some program on it then you still need to decrypt it and uh, even though it's a program decrypting it there is still a risk that uh, while a program is running somebody might inject malware on bob's machine and steal the decrypted uh, message right um, or the keys so all of that uh, is uh, outside the scope of encryption really so uh, if uh, anybody has any questions up till this point i can take them now i think uh, we are good if there are any questions there will be in chat and i'll let you know oh sure 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 okay so um, then i'll move on to uh, the other basic primitive uh, which is uh, digital signatures and Uh, what signatures do is they make messages authentic uh, so uh, again uh, this is to in both the physical world and the digital world and in the digital world what you do is that uh, you want to make some message m authentic uh, so you sign it uh, using your secret key now a person who is verifying it he verifies it using your public key so uh, that this verification will not pass unless this signature s was signed using the corresponding secret key so which means that uh, this gives you authenticity that this uh, message was signed by the authority a uh, that has the public key pk right so uh, this makes uh, signatures authentic and it also makes them non repudiable meaning that a cannot later claim to a third party that it did not sign m 
because S is an evidence of it. Um, since this person has the signature S, nobody else could have produced it um, other than A. So it itself is, a, uh, is an evidence that A actually signed it. So uh, this is uh, a useful primitive to, uh, to do dispute resolutions. Uh, but you should be um, aware that the security of encryption and digital signatures uh, goes only as far as the security of the keys go. Uh, so whoever has access to the secret keys can actually uh, do the decryptions, can actually sign messages and all that. Uh, so key management is uh, a separate issue, which uh, we won't go too much uh, in today's talk, but uh, you should be aware. And finally, uh, I want to talk about these uh, one-way functions as well. Um, so what one-way functions do is that um, given a message M, uh, a function H is a one-way function. Uh, if starting from M, computing H is easy, but starting from H, computing M is hard. Uh, so looking at H, you cannot find which message might have produced this hash. Uh, and uh, traditionally, uh, you might have seen this in uh, when you download large files, um, uh, you know, you, uh, they give you an MD5 hash. And that hash uh, represents, that hash is computed on the message. But looking at the message, you cannot find out which, uh, looking at the hash, you cannot find out which message produced it. Uh, and so this H appears to be randomly generated. So this is also the basis of how do you generate uh, pseudo random numbers. Uh, and uh, more, most of these uh, cryptographic hashes are also uh, collision resistant, which means that uh, um, given uh, H, it's also hard to find out another M and such that uh, the hash of that M matches H. Uh, so um, what this means is that um, if you have uh, the hash, then you can be uh, reasonably certain that it was produced by the same message uh, it was produced the first time. So uh, a simple use case would be uh, a password, uh, password example. So uh, when websites is stored, your password, they don't store it in plain text, they store a hash of it. Um, and just by matching the hash, they can be sure that uh, it was produced by the same uh, plain text password and nothing else. Hi, Prashant, can you yeah. use your pointer when you explain some of these functions? Uh, so your is mouse. it the annotate button? Your, your mouse just where you are in this uh, Actually, slide, you can't uh, go. I'm trying to do it, but uh, uh, I'm unable to. It's okay, fine. Let's go ahead. Okay. All right. So, um, so basically, so far I have covered the basic primitives, which uh, you, uh, which are pervasive in most uh, of cryptography uh, and most of data security, actually. Uh, so now I am kind of transitioning into uh, the um, data privacy principles or uh, and techniques to achieve uh, data protection. And the uh, first principle is uh, data minimization. It is also called uh, uh, minimum disclosure principle. Um, and this is just uh, uh, the age old adage that um, share only the minimum amount of data required for the purpose. So. Uh, if I want to prove to somebody that uh, I am over 18 years, uh, so I am allowed to drink or drive, I don't need to disclose my exact date of birth or my unique uh, identity, like uh, you need to do with uh, paper-based driving licenses and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, similarly, if, you want, you are, if you're collecting some information for statistical purposes, for analytics purposes, then you don't need uh, my personally identifiable information. You uh, are okay if I give you anonymized information. So this is the general data minimization principle. And uh, there are various 
techniques and concepts uh, which enable data minimization uh, and we'll go through uh, each of them uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, the anonymity and unlinkability database anonymization so um, okay let's go over uh, the zero knowledge proofs zero knowledge proofs are techniques uh, which let you prove a statement without revealing anything other than the statement itself and while this may sound a little uh, counterintuitive um, it is actually quite a useful primitive uh, for privacy so for example you can prove that um, i know the secret key corresponding to a public key and thus identify yourself as the owner of that public key uh, without revealing the secret key itself right so uh, that will let you identify without revealing um, the secret key that you hold right and in order to drive this point across i'll actually uh, do a zero knowledge proof right now so um, i have this uh, sudoku example and what i'll do is uh, so i am the prover and uh, you all are the verifiers and i want to prove that i know the solution to this sudoku puzzle without uh, telling you the solution itself right so you need to be convinced that i know the solution but uh, you uh, cannot know the solution right um, and uh, just for people who don't uh, know the rules of sudoku uh, basically for a correct solution of sudoku uh, each row each column and each 3 uh, by 3 box all of them must contain all the numbers from 1 to 9 so that is the definition of a correct solution and i'll prove that i have one of uh, one of it i know one of it so um, what i'll do is the first step is called a commitment um, so um, commitment means that i need to commit to the solution so that if you later ask me questions about the solution i am not interactively changing the solutions so that would uh, be cheating right so how do i commit uh, i have a, a little card for each uh, cell of the sudoku and uh, on the face of the card this face up uh, i write uh, the number that will go in that cell and uh, on the back of the card i write the location so by writing the location and placing it on so and then i place all the cards on the sudoku grid uh, i am committed that i cannot change uh, whatever is under c3 for example right so under c3 i'll always have 9 mm. for example so um, you must know that this commitment is both uh, binding in the sense that i cannot uh, later go back on it and it is also hiding uh, meaning that after looking at these face down cards you cannot uh, identify what the solution is right so in that sense it is hiding and binding both uh, and this is a, a very useful primitive uh, which is used in all zero knowledge proofs um, uh, i can actually give you another um, often cited uh, analogy of commitment and that is that if i want to commit to a value i write it in a piece of paper i put it in a box i lock it i send the box to you but i keep the keys with me so which means that when you uh, look at the box uh, the value which is inside uh, cannot be changed i cannot go and change it but since you don't have the key uh, you cannot open the box and uh, read the value so in that way it is hiding so this is actually uh, quite a useful primitive for zero knowledge proofs and uh, we see an example of that in this zero knowledge proof as well so uh, this is the first step uh, in the second step now the uh, verifier so you uh, will ask me to open any random uh, column or row or a 3 by 3 box and what i have to, what i have to do is uh, i have to open them uh, and i'll have to shuffle them and then present them to you so uh, when i present them to you you see that oh uh, these cards actually um, have uh, all numbers from 1 to 9 present which means that the um, solution for this particular column actually satisfies the condition for a correct sudoku solution but uh, i may have cheated in other columns or other rows right or other boxes so you don't know but if you repeat again 
now uh, since i don't know which column or which row you are going to ask uh, to open uh, if you repeat again uh, my chances of uh, not getting caught drop exponentially right so if i repeat k times my chances of uh, uh, not getting caught uh, drop exponentially um, of the order of 1 over 2 to the k right so um, and this is actually huge which means that and so uh, just to give you an example if i repeat this process 60 times uh, and uh, i have a, a probability of not getting caught of 1 over 2 to 2 to the power 60 that is almost as rare an event as uh, an event which happens in 100 billion years once so uh, that is practically uh, certain that i have not cheated so zero knowledge proofs uh, by this uh, um, virtue of verifiers being able to ask random challenges which are unpredictable by the prover uh, give you this uh, overwhelming probability right and this is uh, the basis of all zero knowledge proofs um but finally at the end uh, what you also need to do is that you need to reveal that uh, um, reveal the uh, locations where the original problem uh, was marked so that i i know that you have solved the given problem and not some other problem so for example the 7 3 in uh, row b5 and b6 match the original problem right Uh, so um, i know you have not solved some other problem so at the end of it i am convinced so at the end of it uh, you are convinced that uh, i know the solution but you do not learn anything about the solution and in that sense it's a zero knowledge proof so um, this is the typical structure actually of all uh, zero knowledge proofs you have a commitment step and then you have some random challenges uh, uh, given by the verifier and um, and they are followed by a response by the prover and this uh, commitment is actually not just uh, a physical concept it's a cryptographic construct too uh, you have this binding and hiding properties uh, in that commitment primitive uh, yeah uh, and then uh, the other point is that uh, you know this uh, uh, this mechanism of proving uh, was interactive and uh, uh, that is uh, inconvenient in many contexts so um, but uh, remember those uh, one way hash functions um, so the hash function the output of the hash function appears to be randomly generated right so you can actually make uh, interactive zero knowledge proofs and convert them to non interactive zero knowledge proofs by uh, using the hash functions uh, the output of uh, hash functions to act as the random challenge so the uh, the guarantee there is that nobody knows what the output of a hash function would be um, the hash function is applied on the problem itself so nobody knows what the output of the hash function would be on this problem uh, and so the prover uh, cannot guess Uh, where the challenges will come what uh, questions will be asked in the challenges and you get the same guarantees right uh, so that gives you uh, the ability to attach a certificate uh, a certificate which does not require any interaction you publish it and people can verify later right uh, but the most important thing to take away is that Uh, actually you might think that oh this is a mm, silly example but uh, uh, actually all practical statements can be proved in zero knowledge uh, with this uh, overwhelming probability uh, so that is a very strong statement and uh, mm, this for people who uh, are a little more uh, technically oriented um, all practical statement means uh, all np statements that is which can be verified in some polynomial time but i am not going into those details um, you can think of it as uh, everything uh, which is uh, verifiable easily uh, can be proved in zero knowledge so i think uh, at this point i uh, would want to uh, maybe pause for a minute to take some questions if 
there are any questions uh, prashant i think there is some confusion among people to understand the difference between hash functions and encryption okay okay can you just help with them that before yeah. and people might ask you more questions on zero knowledge proofs sure so yeah, encryption is um, for a particular party so you encrypt something for uh, the um, for the receiving party so that nobody in transit can decrypt it but that party who for whom you are encrypting that party can decrypt it right but hash functions are unconditional so looking at this h nobody can uh, find out what the source m was uh, and they are just used as a random uh, number generator you can think about it so i think that should answer the encryption versus hash function question yeah but there is uh, one thing uh, for most of the people who may not understand or uh, mm -hmm. we keep finding faults with hash functions all the time in the sense that in theory you're not supposed to you you think about it in theory you're not supposed to know the uh, actual message from the hash uh, but in practice i mean there are plenty of workarounds to avoid it but but in a sense if you look at the technology of computer science in general we keep inventing harder and harder uh, Uh, to reverse engineer hash functions in the sense that you can't look at a hash and figure out what is the message it has gotten to a place where the older ones are broken like md5 and all that but the newer ones are pretty hard to break right uh, you know if i may add there uh, it is always easier to define a hash function than break it so um, and and uh, infinitely exponentially easier to define a new hash function than to break it so uh, when a hash function becomes uh, vulnerable you can always uh, move on to a harder harder hash function so this is a game that goes on in security uh, but you know right now for privacy uh, what is important to understand that there is a there is an instrument of a hash function that can give you a a signature of a message right a uh, untamperable signature of a message right now whether it is really the untamperability guarantee uh, may come into question sometimes but it can always be enforced by by suitable care so so the base idea is always this i mean if you're looking at hash it's one of the most foundational uh thing in computer science i mean there's really no privacy security cryptography nothing whatsoever without one day hash functions yeah Yeah. just to uh, just to add a little bit over there i think uh, when we say break a hash function it just i mean typically people who are working at breaking hash functions will typically just find two inputs that produce the same hash and say hey hash function broken uh, i don't think that necessarily equates immediately to being able to tamper with a message and and you know mess the signature up so i think just something to keep a track of that you know just finding two inputs that have the same hash doesn't necessarily completely invalidate the use of that hash function as a way to sign things correct um, and also i mean um, hash functions which are guaranteed to be collision resistant uh, i think finding uh, two messages which uh, produce the same hash is also a hard problem exactly i mean so you you know you just produced two random sets of data that had the same hash doesn't mean you were able to tamper a message and you know uh, practically implement it in a in a forgery attack okay. yeah okay. it depends yeah. on how hard in the sense that uh, let us say you are able to find uh, two random bits of information that produce same hash after 2 power 64 iterations we don't consider it good enough but on the contrary if it is 2 power 32 maybe yeah exactly eight, definitely broken that kind of stuff exactly like what's the number of iterations what's the effort involved in 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 implementing it practically should be definitely an evaluation metric so in computer science we call it a polynomial time bounded adversary should not be able to break it precisely you should not be able to do that a quantum computer so, in, in simple so, words so a uh, adversary with finite resources uh, should not be able to break it um, and uh, that you know such hash functions are theoretically easy to define there are practical usability issues but uh, again as i said it's easier to define a hash function secure hash function than to break it so you will always win the race yeah. uh, i think we are going to come 
towards encryption more further down the presentation but does anyone have more questions or around zero knowledge proofs or can prashant move ahead i'm assuming everyone gets zero knowledge proofs but okay prashant no, yeah no no srinivas uh, let me be honest okay uh, zkps are one of the most complicated uh, bits in computer science and so the way in which at least i hope our audience is non technical the way in which we have to go back and look at is is that take something that is very common use case something that people face it on a day, daily basis uh, and not even sudoku and then go back and figure out how to do zkp i mean i think that is basically where uh, we have to go back um yeah but i think uh, the problem there is that a zkp of something which we do commonly uh, would be uh, very difficult to present uh, essentially uh, it requires a lot of math and uh, uh, you only get uh, an intuition uh, but the uh, the actual uh, bits and pieces and the nitty gritties of zero knowledge proof they lie in how the commitment scheme is secure and how you do the random challenges how you convert from interactive to non interactive and all that yeah i mean at least for me right i i had i had spent a lot of time on zkps Uh, okay. they are not intuitive at all i mean they're extremely counterintuitive uh, every time you go and tell it to a common person i mean imagine a bureaucrat government bureaucrat sitting on the other end you're going to come back and saying i can tell you that someone knows a secret without me knowing a secret i mean it is like so counterintuitive actually uh, it's not if you go down the track that the sadhus have been taking for years ki mere ko mantra aata hai but i won't tell you what it is but it will be effective yeah yeah So somewhere on the line, I think that is a part we have to go back. I mean, on, on initial session is okay, but Kodali, let's not have any intuitions about how hard ZKPs are. Okay. I think uh, the challenge for, to explain cryptography to people is how you bring proof with math. Uh, I think Prashant will focus on that in a bit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm trying to keep the math away actually uh, for this uh, presentation, but yes. Uh, they like can't said maybe in for the sessions you can go back yeah prashant before you go on perhaps it might be a good idea to give a little bit of intuition in converting the interactive to the non interactive okay uh, so That's the intuition yeah so the intuition there is that uh, um, interactive uh, okay so how do zero knowledge proofs uh, derive their power they derive their power by the prover not being able to guess what questions you will ask right so in this slide basically the power of a zero knowledge proof comes from the fact that you cannot guess which column i'll go, uh, i'll ask you to open right so you don't know where to cheat and wherever you cheat uh, if i ask you uh, enough number of times you are more than likely to be uh, caught right now uh, this unpredictability can be captured either by the verifier interactively uh, generating some random numbers and asking you questions or this unpredictability can come from one way hash functions also because one way hash functions are unpredictable um, by definition uh, so if you uh, do a hash of the problem which means that so the problem is given to you once so you don't know what Uh, hash it will produce you have not seen the problem before and if you have not seen the problem before a hash of that would be completely unpredictable and that forms the basis of the challenges so that forms the basis of the random numbers which ask the challenges uh, and then you can't answer um, you can't cheat you can't place your uh, cheating answers um, intelligently um, because whatever you do uh, it's more than likely you will be caught so that's the uh, intuition from uh, interactive to non interactive so um, so you basically say that i have um, computed so basically what you do is that you write your in your responses you write the responses to all the challenges which a hash function would have asked so after the hash function uh, is applied on the problem and the challenges that you get um, from those random numbers you write the responses of those uh, those random challenges and somebody else who verifies they also calculate the same hash and um, the underlying assumption is that you don't know what hash uh, this problem will generate so the verifier is convinced that 
the responses that you wrote down were actually for some random instances, were not cooked up by you, essentially. Uh, Prashant, two things. Huh? One is, uh, uh, don't get into too much computer science, right? Uh, yeah. Second is, I'll go into a little bit of computer science and just uh, point out that the fiat shell protocol uh, may not always be practical for all ZKP problems. So not all ZKP problems can be made non-interactive easily. And the non-interactive proof may become arbitrarily large, exponential size for some ZKPs. So some ZKPs can give you small proofs, all right? The others may require infinite space to write them down. So there is a dichotomy there, right? So this uh, has to be, there's a caveat uh, that uh, not all interactive ZKPs can be converted to non-interactive ZKPs in a practical sense. Theoretically, yes, all of them can. Okay, so uh, I guess I can move ahead now. Yeah. Okay. We'll always come back, I guess. As we go further, we'll always ask questions. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so I'll go back to you know, come to this uh, topic of um, anonymity and unlinkability. And uh, anonymity is simply the state of uh, not being identifiable in a set of individuals. So uh, you are anonymous only with respect to a set of individuals um, which are under consideration. Um, so so that in that way, there's a, a slight subtle difference between anonymity and privacy, mm, right? Um, so, mm, and when you are transacting with, uh, you know, organizations, uh, there is this concept of uh, unlinkable anonymity which means that, uh, you know, multiple transactions that you do, none of them are, uh, first of all, they are not linkable to your true identity. And second of all, that uh, even multiple transactions, which are coming from the same individual, uh, nobody can identify that they belong to the same individual, right? So in that way, uh, they are not linkable uh, at all. So uh, I've tried to show that in this diagram that uh, suppose this R1 and R2 are two uh, random numbers and the first transaction sends some F of R1, the second transaction sends F of R2. Now uh, T1 and T2 are completely unlinkable. Uh, nobody knows whether they came from the same individual or different individuals or whatnot, right? So that's unlinkable anonymity. In linkable anonymity, you still get this um, anonymity in the sense you're, that your true identity is not revealed. In this uh, random number R, whether it belongs to you or somebody else is not known. But uh, multiple transactions that you do, uh, both of them depend on this same uh, random number, meaning that somebody can identify that, oh yes, these two transactions belong to the same individual or not. So that is uh, linkable anonymity. Uh, and you know, the, to get a balance between privacy and utility, you kind of need both, uh, depending on the use case. Right? Uh, so this leads us to this uh, notion of uh, virtual identities, uh, which was uh, pioneered by Chom, uh, David Chom in 1985. And this is the notion that, you know, the indi individuals own a master identity and from this master identity, they are able to generate uh, um, random looking virtual identities. So this individual gives a virtual identity A to um, organization A and VID B to organization B. Now VID A and VID B, they appear to be completely random numbers. And uh, this gives you, first of all, unlinkable anonymity for all inter-organization transactions. So if a transaction involves uh, uh, communication with A as well as communication with B, uh, those two uh, transactions cannot be linked together because VID A and VID B are completely unlinkable. Uh, and with respect to a single organization, uh, if you keep on using the same VID with B, then all the transactions that you uh, do with uh, B are linkable. But uh, use cases may demand that you use different virtual identities for each transaction. So in that case, they are all unlinkable. And uh, I think maybe tomorrow we'll 
uh, issue a covid app uh, where you know you see all these uh, covid apps they generate random tokens every time and uh, they all are collected somewhere now all these random tokens you can think of them as virtual identities and they are all unlinkable so uh, you have uh, the place for both depending on the use case and uh, finally uh, you know these virtual identity a uh, may need to be linked with virtual identity b uh, depending on again the use case uh, you may want to link uh, uh, you know the financial status of uh, uh, people with their medical data uh, right so uh, there the uh, the purpose limitation of it of the linkability is extremely important you only want uh, that linkage to happen for a given purpose and do not want uh, that purpose to be extended right uh, and that is something we will talk about later on so um, you know this um, inter organization transactions where we have two organizations uh, a very common um, problem that of course there is that Uh, and this is actually uh, quite common in uh, public service applications uh, and that is that uh, you know a is uh, um, some organization uh, which gives uh, some credential to the individual and uh, the individual wants to present this credential to b without uh, either without letting either a or b link the two vids right so for example a is the college he went to and b is the employer Uh, the person wants to convince the employer that he has a certain degree, uh, but he does not want them to link uh, VID A and VID B. Right? Otherwise, uh, um, whatever information is associated with VID A could be linked with the information associated with VID B, right? And that is where uh, the anonymous credentials come in, and they let you do this. Um, so uh, the regular credentials uh, uh, simple digital signatures uh, we have seen before that uh, you know the organization a gives a sign on a message m uh, and that is s now this signature is uh, presented to b and in order for b to verify it it needs to know the uh, the actual message right uh, and uh, then it verifies it now if this message is against the vid which uh, Uh, the individual shares with a then this verification process naturally leaks um, vid a to b right and then um, accordingly vid a and vid b could be linked so this is the problem that anonymous credentials uh, can solve uh, and they are often based on these blind signatures and uh, these blind signatures are transformable so you can think of it this way that uh, you blind a message Uh, meaning, uh, you uh, you obtain a signature on uh, VID A has degree X, and then you are able to transform it to VID B has degree X. So you can only change this blinding factor, which is the uh, VID A or VID B, and uh, you can change that. Um, so once B obtains uh, this signature. it sees the signature against the vid that it knows so it cannot link and similarly a cannot link where all the credentials obtained have been used so there is no possibility of uh, tracking uh, where the signatures go and how they are used and so this is actually uh, a very important data minimization principle uh, each organization only identifies individuals with uh, the virtual identities they present and nothing else is uh, kind of linkable so this also allows you uh, to handle the linkability in uh, linkability problem in um, for example aadhar you don't need to have a unique id you just uh, have virtual identities and that should be enough um, each purpose uh, should have a virtual identity prashant if i may add uh, so chom uh, gives two schemes for achieving the same thing so he yeah. first of course uh, shows that this can be done with blind signatures and gives a scheme for blind signatures 
it's a little bit mathematical to describe here, but uh, it exists and it's a very sound technique. But you could do the same thing with a zero knowledge proof also. Uh, and uh, Chom uh, also gives a construct where uh, this transformation of messages across entities preserving uh, privacy is possible using a simple ZKP. And in this case, the ZKP can be uh, uh, non interactive as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, if there are questions for with respect to anonymous credentials, uh, maybe I can take them up. Uh, perhaps you want, might want to comment uh, this uh, unlinkability even when A and B collude. Yeah. So um, even if A and B they collude, they cannot uh, they cannot link uh, S B versus with S A. So let's say A and B were to share all the signatures they gave out and all the signatures they received, S A and S B they appear to be completely um, random. So uh, in that way, even if A and B collude, uh, these, um, they give you this unlinkability guarantee. So that's a scenario which is usually seen when departments, inter-departments share data with say MHA, for example, right? Right, right. This, this is what was most surprising because this, uh, this paper from Chom is from 1985. Uh, so many, many years have passed. And uh, this paper says that how to make Big Brother obsolete. That's the title of the paper. It came in communications of the ACM. And it's an absolute seminal paper on privacy. And everything out there is trivial to implement. And yet, almost 40 years later, you find strange schemes that don't do, uh, that don't uh, look at this, these techniques. It's interesting that it came out a year after 1984, huh? Yeah. yeah. And refers to the pair, refers to the 1984 work. It says it refers to some coincidences are just uh, almost supernatural. Mm -hmm. uh, Prashant, but if there are there are scenarios which Professor Banerjee always refers to where we want linkability, right? Like, mm. uh, but we would want linkability with access control, say. You only right. want certain departments, like the health department in particular, to be in a right. position to actually know the identity of the individuals right. in case right. of a pandemic. Yeah. So anonymous credentials essentially don't fit that scenario entirely, right? Or are you saying? No, so anonymous credentials, uh, you can also have anonymous credentials, which um, provide you optional uh, revocability of anonymity in a way that uh, uh, some trusted authority uh, can be uh, set up which is able to uh, link them. But then uh, at that point, you have to ask the question, how do we purpose limit that trusted authority that it cannot misuse it? And that's a separate question. You look into that in future now? Uh, yes, in yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. So uh, I'll move on to this uh, third um, data minimization um, principle uh, technique, uh, which is the database anonymization. And uh, this is typically um, kind of, uh, so you, you do anonymize data only uh, for non-statistical uh, databases also. But typically, when you want to do analytics, then there is no reason for you to ask uh, personally identifiable information. And that's why anonymization is um, a hot strategy to do, right? You, uh, you hide your name, you hide your age, uh, you hide your location, and replace them with some, um, uh, some course information, or you add some noise there, and you believe that your data is anonymized, right? Um, so as an example here, uh, you know, this uh, name uh, is uh, replaced with stars, uh, age is replaced with a range, so this is a um, reasonably anonymized database. Uh, and there are many notions of um, this anonymization, database anonymization. Uh, for example, key anonymity talks about, uh, uh, you know, we will anonymize uh, in such a way that uh, all, that at least K individuals have the same uh, attributes. And similarly, there are L diversity, T closeness, multiple notions, but I will not go into them. 
uh, what I will say uh, is at a high level, um, this approach does not work. Uh, and the reason is very simple, that uh, as you keep on adding more dimensions, more columns to your database, uh, you, you can think of uh, each individual being projected to a very high dimensional space as a point. And this high dimensional space is uh, um, extremely sparse, meaning uh, that it is very unlikely that uh, someone else with uh, who, whose 10 attributes match with mine. Uh, to find such an individual is very rare. To find an individual whose 20 attributes match with mine is even rare, is much, much rare, right? So uh, that is why this uh, high dimensional space is extremely sparse. And what these anonymization techniques do is that they just uh, add some noise. So they add uh, noise meaning you are not identifiable anymore with a point, but you are identifiable with uh, a sphere, a sphere surrounding that point. But since this space is so sparse, there are not many other individuals in that space. So uh, you essentially are identifiable um, even after anonymization. And uh, a very intuitive uh, way to understand that is that even though you collect data about me and you remove my name and uh, where I work. Uh, but uh, if you uh, tell me, if you tell that, uh, okay, uh, this is a person uh, who is a PhD student in computer science at Delhi and uh, um, is uh, aged this much and is this, uh, his height is this much, uh, all these attributes combined together uh, certainly identify me. So even though they are not really identifiers individually, but when combined together, they uh, necessarily become a pseudo identifier. And that is a huge problem. And it is actually quite well established that anonymization never works. And this is uh, established through various kinds of attacks. Uh, so people have attacked anonymized social network data, location data. So for example, uh, there was this nature paper, which uh, was able to de-anonymize people uh, by tracking just four um, spatio-temporal coordinates. So they uh, track from your mobile GPS, they track four uh, coordinates uh, where uh, in the day. So assuming uh, everyone follows the same path to their office, uh, they are uh, able to uh, identify you with, with very strong precision uh, with just location data, right? And um, you are identifiable by how you write code or uh, how, how your browser history looks like. So all these things which you would never consider are actually your identifiers, they become your identifiers. Uh, and this is a huge problem. And I think uh, this is something which uh, uh, should be immediately uh, understood that uh, anonymization, we always talk about anonymization, uh, and th but this is never enough, right? So uh, I hope that uh, picture is roughly clear, uh, but uh, I also wanted to give a little bit of theoretical uh, reason to it. And uh, there was this paper uh, which talked about that no matter how you anonymize, uh, if you have a database with uh, some n rows and your adversary is asking, let's say, order of n queries, then it can almost reconstruct the entire database. And uh, that is actually not very surprising because um, if you think about it, even if you're asking like um, statistical queries, like uh, what is the average with, uh, of this particular segment of the population, that uh, amounts to you know, solving a bunch of linear equations to identify what the value for each individual uh, row was. So um, that way, uh, the entire database could always be reconstructed. Uh, and this, this is why uh, anonymization actually um, does not work. So, um, 
if uh, there are questions here i can take them uh i think there are a few questions in the group uh the uh, in the chat people are asking can you give more nuance on that like how easy difficult is it to de-anonymize in theory no lock is completely safe too but we still rely on those to keep ourselves safe in our houses so how easy is it to de-anonymize right. so i think uh, first of all uh, it is hard to put a bound on how easy it is to de-anonymize because it depends on what you already know right uh, but otherwise these attacks are actually quite efficient and they are quite easy so uh, yes the for different kinds of databases you would have to design uh, maybe different anonymization uh, different attack techniques but uh, um, if you follow similar principles you would be able to get a lot of information so and even though you are not able to exactly pinpoint uh, exactly de identify uh, who the individuals are but you will get a lot of information about them and that is the, uh, the problem so if i may add on to that um, while it is impossible to derive a bound on the easiness of uh, de anonymization because de anonymization is not a contained problem it uses auxiliary information from multiple sources but there have been enough attacks uh, from arvin narayan and several several others have demonstrated uh that you know it will be somewhat foolhardy to depend on this technique so this technique is considered even now despite all this work as a primary privacy preserving technique but i think that uh, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny so every time you are using anonymization you have to be extremely careful uh, anonymization is a primary method you have to be extremely careful there will almost always be an inferential privacy attack possible and uh, you know the princeton group has shown that uh, these attacks are also very very computationally efficient you know solving linear equations for example and uh, they can be orchestrated with uh, almost effortless ease uh, just to uh, add to what prakhar was uh, hinting at you know that no lock is secure but we still use that to secure ourselves i think just taking that thinking a little bit forward i think you know it also we also vary the kind of lock we use on different kind of assets uh we also uh, engage with policy to ensure that you know even though some things are not locked like public spaces they are not damaged so there's a whole range of thinking that that derives from that locked question uh yeah. but i think uh, it's so relevant to come, come up you know and so this is, of course depends on the use case the kind of security or kind of privacy preserving technique that you push it but if you are talking about a national level database uh you know like electronic health record and so on so forth uh a public service database which is for the whole nation for 1.3 billion people then the privacy standards will have to be significantly higher absolutely and I mean, cannot be in front of certain public monuments right so so just i mean think from that point of view something that is so relevant and so central and so public needs to have a completely different policy level thinking around the security it's not the same as locking your house Prashant, just one final question before we move on. The, uh, there is one question whether some, this is not a computer science question, but uh, whether can someone file an RTI actually to find out what the data minimization technique is being used inside garment? Uh, but at the same time, I want to bring in uh, this case of the sale of anonymized data that Ministry of Road Transport actually stopped this week. they were selling around 12 parameters of each vehicle owner on type of vehicle color of vehicle and uh, so on and they finally decided that this data can be de-anonymized we don't know how they have decided or what they have done uh, but they have essentially stopped the sale of data uh, but if if you look who bought the data the companies like transocean civil which have access to other parallel databases but there are also companies like ola which directly have access to your location data so how would uh, a de-anonymization attack on these data sets would look like in different scenarios like when you look at some of these parameters so prashant can i take that it will almost um, it will almost always be a linear equation attack you know you'll form a set of linear equations and solve it in uh, 
low order polynomial time complexity to to do it when you yeah. when you hear something like that you know selling um, the the transport department's data i think that the default null hypothesis assumption has to be that it can be de-anonymized rather than that it is safe you know the default assumption should so that's why this anonymization is a myth uh, slide is important the default assumption should be that it is uh, de-anonymizable so if the designer thinks otherwise then that must come with a proof that must come with a some kind of a guarantee that anonymization in this special case is hard you know most my anonymizations can be broken trivially uh there is a us census paper uh, around the same area uh so if you look at and they even wrote a public paper around it and they said uh, uh they were able to solve the entire uh, anonymization de-anonymization problem with 400 plus linear equations and uh, on a pentium processor for the data set that they had published it it was about 350 seconds or something like that yeah uh, and i think so um, if uh, we are talking about the same paper uh, it was uh, uh, concluded that all americans at least 87% of americans could be identified with their uh, date of birth age and so uh, and uh, name three something like that three parameters just you just three add, parameters yeah. yeah you just give me three more parameters and then give me the anonymized data set i'm going to identify 87% or 90% of it i think that is the paper they wrote It is right. actually done by the census bureau, not by any academic person. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and also, uh, with respect to uh, Shrinivas, your question, um, there's also the um, problem of linking. So uh, I talked about this high-dimensional uh, spaces, right? So if you are able to link multiple databases using uh, certain parameters, then suddenly your dimensions increase, right? so you are able to suddenly jump from 10 dimensional space to a 20 dimensional space because you can now link um, those together right uh, and uh, especially for companies like ola that would be a huge risk right uh, so yeah, yeah that, that's what i wanted to bring uh, with respect to rti uh, i think the problem is that uh, um, the loss of privacy can never be quantified so if you know something how do i know you know it right so uh, and how are you going to use it is also not quantifiable so uh, i think uh, the rti um, approach maybe uh, it is a good defense in the uh, in the case when we don't have uh, when we don't have any other strategy than anonymization but uh, in general it is not a very um, strong uh, way to protect privacy yeah i think the uh, post audit approach basically you are saying that you audit uh, how uh, things happened but uh, um, i think this is uh, um, if you look at um, another one of uh, privacy principles they call privacy should be preventive not reactive and uh, the precise reason for that is that it is very hard to put a uh, put a bound on oh, okay whether privacy loss happen or not uh, uh, whether you read something whether you know something or not is very hard to um, judge Uh, i think there is one short question and we can move on which is why is it that the default assumption that it can be de-anonymized uh, because there are so many attacks uh, out there and uh, uh, it is pretty much well established in computer science that anonymization does not work also just given the amount of data collection going on you uh, it's already somewhere right so you have to you and since you can't guarantee again you know it's almost a form of zero knowledge since you have zero knowledge of what people are going to do with that data you must assume certain things at a base level that's why yeah yeah and especially if it is a public database uh, it's out there where i mean if it is a controlled database where every query is controlled then even then you can uh, say something but if it is released then uh, once it's released it's released i think the rti question was also uh, it was not what you answered the, the person was asking whether 
you can ask in an RTI the question relating to the technique used for anonymization. Um, I, I, I think that is a question for Srinivas. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know, right? It, we never know, especially with these days. But uh, code, I wasn't able to ever get access to any code inside the garment. Data, maybe, but code, no. So any technique, uh, unfortunately, no. Prashant, I think we can move on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so actually, um, this is a continuation of what we discussed. And this is the... Um, try to... Okay. Uh, you will lose your po uh, mouse pointer if you go uh, full screen. Okay. Actually, I wanted to show them step by step. Just a second. Okay. Yeah. So um, I wanted to talk about this um, impossibility of absolute privacy. So this is. Uh, uh, continuing from the anonymization discussion, what you would want from uh, what would be your um, absolute privacy goal, and this is also called inferential privacy. That uh, there's a database that you designed, and you want it to be private, right? So, what does it mean to be private? You want to uh, say that if a person A has access to the database, A should not be able to obtain any information about an individual that B cannot obtain. B does not have access to the database. So if A obtains some information about an individual by interacting with the database, it means that the database leaked some information. Right? And this is what you would want. But uh, this is actually, uh, this was shown that this is impossible to achieve, uh, especially if uh, the adversary, whoever is talking to the database, has arbitrary amount of side information. So. If the person has, if the adversary has arbitrary information, this uh, is impossible to achieve. And I'll give you a very simple example of that. And that is suppose that um, the this is common knowledge that the salary of the director of a company is twice the um, average salary of all um, all employees. Now, for a person B, that is all the person knows, right? But uh, uh, for person A uh, who has access to the database, it can make a simple statistical query, um, the average of the salary, which does not seem to uh, be um, violating privacy in any way. And he gets uh, um, the average. Now, by using this auxiliary information, he is able to find out the salary of the director, which is an individual, right? Uh, and this is uh, um, a very simple example uh, to demonstrate that uh, this absolute inferential privacy uh, is uh, impossible to achieve. Uh, and you should note that um, for this attack, for someone to know the salary of the director, uh, the director does not need to be uh, participating in the database, right? The director. Uh, would not be in the database, even if predict is not in the database, uh, you will find out uh, the director's salary. Uh, so it means that the um, privacy loss is not only limited to people who actually participate in the database, but also to other people, right? And this uh, uh, kind of observation gave rise to this notion of differential privacy. So differential privacy is uh, changing the goalpost. They, uh, the goal of differential privacy is that we know that uh, in an absolute sense, when you uh, let people interact with databases, your absolute privacy would be lost. There will be some loss to your privacy. But what we will guarantee is that the additional privacy risk that you incur by participating in the database, that additional privacy risk is minimal. Uh, so whatever privacy loss you will incur will mostly be uh, something which you would have already lost because uh, because uh, because of other people or because of the impossibility of 
inferential privacy right uh, so this is the goal of uh, differential privacy uh, and uh, um, typically what is done is that uh, the analyst asks some question some queries uh, to the database and you evaluate um, you evaluate the query you see that uh, okay if i answer uh, answer this query um, accurately then um, whether by changing just one row in the database by changing just one individual's data in the database how much would the answer change right and what we are trying to protect is that uh, whether an individual participates in the database or not uh, their privacy risk should be the same because we are trying to minimize the additional privacy risk so you uh, you measure how much uh, privacy loss will happen if i change just one row of the database and you try to minimize that and accordingly you basically add a noise uh, such that uh, no matter how much you change a single row the answer will not change essentially uh, so which means that uh, after getting this answer uh, the analyst is not able to uh, even figure out whether you particularly whether a particular individual is in the database or not right so even though uh, he will be able to find the director's salary but uh, um, he will not be able to um, he would be able to find that out even if the director was not in the database right so this is the um, technique of you know interactively you uh, calibrate the noise as per the sensitivity to maintain users differential privacy and um, perhaps you can already see uh, some problems with uh, differential privacy and that is first of all as your query sensitivity increases meaning if you ask a query which uh, depends very much on a single rows data then uh, in order to protect the privacy of that individual uh, you have to add a lot of noise so as query sensitivity increases your noise increases and this is also why uh, differential privacy can never be used for any non statistical databases so something like financial transactions right or um, simple oltp um, transactions right um, which are not statistical where you are not doing analytics they are not uh, doable with differential privacy right um, secondly you know uh, for each type of query you have to design the noise you want to add how you will add the noise uh, appropriately so that you get uh, good enough utility while maintaining differential privacy so there is always this inherent um, utility versus privacy trade off uh, and for the same reason uh, you cannot uh, answer many many queries otherwise the reconstruction attacks which we saw earlier they are also possible uh, with differential privacy um, and finally uh, even uh, keeping aside all these problems uh, you talk about uh, one individual's differential privacy but um, what do you do about community level profiling uh, so somebody gets doesn't get to know specifically uh, your attributes but gets to know certain profile of um, people belonging to a certain community um, as demonstrated by the cambridge analytica episode right so how do you prevent all that uh, is not clear uh, so so yeah this is a uh, problem with differential privacy so i think uh, at this point i'll also um, I, i'll stop again um, to see if there are sure, no other questions the point with differential privacy so differential privacy is a significantly weaker goal compared to yeah. inferential privacy right so this is shifting the goal post by quite a bit actually so you are saying just the uh, inferential privacy loss is inevitable what is the additional loss that i can prevent from happening that's what differential privacy is 
Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that point. So the use cases for each of these te techniques are different in different scenarios because you mentioned the scenario where you can't use this for financial transactions, but differential privacy, for example, could be a really good thing to be used for say credit scoring, right? Like you can't- For analytics, use... yes, yes, yes. Uh. So within, within the sector, you would have to look at different scenarios where it hmm. would fit, but it's yeah. not like one solution for all. Uh, uh, yeah, if I may just uh, uh, sort of interrupt. Uh, differential privacy is not really a technique. It's actually, as uh, Prashant said, it's a goal. It's a definition. It's yeah. a goal post. It's a notion of... Uh, it's a notion. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's sort of interesting in the context of some of the, uh, you know, the ones who are uh, lawyers among you that uh, this notion was uh, sort of uh, appealed to by Manindra Agarwal in his expert testimony in the Aadhaar case. Uh, I personally think it was a, a terrible argument. Shubhashish, I think, disagrees with me uh, because, uh, first of all, I think this differential privacy is a symmetric notion and uh, the, the some argument that Manindra's, uh, Manindra Agarwal's thing, uh, I, I didn't quite buy it. Uh, any case, uh, that's something to look at, uh, which is um, something which is fairly interesting. Uh, in the pandemic situation, uh, or actually uh, in a situation where, forget pandemic, where there is a very clear uh, uh, pressure from the state to uh, in invoke eminent domain, uh, but if you just look at other um, diseases which uh, have some stigma attached to them, uh, these are notions which you have to be a little careful about whether this is an appropriate uh, notion of privacy to be applying to their uh, databases or not. Yeah. So, thanks. so uh, differential privacy is a very individualistic notion that my, I'll be guaranteed that my additional privacy risk uh, will be minimal. but. From a policy maker's point of view, uh, like you said, uh, it's not clear if it is an appropriate notion of privacy to be talking about. So, uh, Srinivas, can we go ahead? Yeah, I think there are just uh, uh, queries on whether this has been implemented in practical scenarios. Has there been a large... Oh, yes. Case? Yes. So, uh, differential privacy was, uh, as a notion, was introduced in 2005. And uh, since then, there are many, many uh, kind of... Uh, this actually started a new field in itself. And uh, there's a lot of work. Uh, but uh, uh, most of them are, first of all, they are... Uh, towards specific uh, problems, meaning uh, uh, for specific type of queries, yes, you can uh, do differential privacy really well. Uh, but uh, uh, you, first of all, you can't, uh, this is not a silver bullet which will answer all your questions. And second of all, the uh, problem with the notion itself is, uh, uh, is unclear. Yeah, I think that's about it. Okay. So, yeah, so then this brings us to, uh, you know, this question, what is the necessary condition of privacy? Uh, I talked about this impossibility of absolute privacy. And I said that financial privacy doesn't quite cut it. So, uh, but what should we do? Uh, so, impossibility of absolute privacy, if you think about it, this... Uh, Impossibility comes because you are allowing uh, the adversaries to do arbitrary processing, right? And so that is where I think uh, we should um, have some mechanisms to stop it. And essentially, what you want to ensure is that all illegal data access and processing must be prevented. So uh, if you want to process some data for a certain purpose, you must declare what purpose uh, you want to collect this data for. And there should be mechanism in place to ensure that only computations which fulfill that purpose and nothing else should be allowed. Uh, that uh, would be in line with the legal principles of purpose specification, use limitation, and so on and so forth. Right? Um, 
and uh, this uh, legitimate purpose what is a legitimate purpose that depends on uh, you know how uh, people have um, consented or what approvals you have what is the authentication of the person who is asking for the data uh, various kinds of uh, these dynamically changing things so you need to have some uh, external body uh, which controls uh, all these things uh, which uh, decides what is legitimate or what is not um and i must point out that uh, um some preliminary work exists on purpose based uh, privacy policies but uh, uh, they were actually um, in an era where uh, controlling what computations uh, must uh, happen was not a notion at all so they used a very poor proxy for purpose so for example uh many of uh, these papers uh, um, take the role of the data requester as the purpose meaning somebody from the accounts department is asking for data meaning they will use it for accounts for the purpose of um, accounting uh, and that uh, clearly is not a sufficient notion um but now as i will demonstrate uh, next we have techniques to uh control uh, what computations may happen on data uh, and that could be leveraged to give you this definition of privacy finally you also need uh, data minimization um not only because uh, not only as a uh, as a further defense in case some of these techniques break but also um when data exits the regulator the controlled boundary right whenever you actually give it to individuals to humans essentially then whatever happens uh, to that data is uh, unbounded right so uh, so at that point you only have a defense approach at hand uh, and you must follow all these data minimization principles to share only the bare minimum that is required for the purpose um so i will uh, so this basically brings us to this um, goal of secure remote execution where um, you must secure data in such a way um, that the remote party that you are giving the data to can only execute a given program on it so you know uh, up front what program they are going to execute and nothing else gets executed uh, they should not be uh, able to use it in any other way right and there are um, cryptographic solutions to it as well as some hardware based solutions to it uh, the cryptographic uh, software based solutions are fully secure uh, in the sense that they do not require uh, trust on anything but they are extremely slow uh, so two popular uh, branches here are homomorphic encryption and uh, secure multi party computation and uh, on the other hand you have the hardware solutions so these solutions they depend on a trusted hardware and you assume that there is some kind of uh, guard in place which uh, uh, ensures that nothing uh, except a given program is executed but uh, these are extremely fast um, by extremely fast i mean extremely fast compared to the cryptographic solutions um there is still uh, some overhead with respect to uh, an unsecure execution but uh, um, they are actually uh, reasonably practical so there is intel sdx uh, which is present in most of today's laptops and desktops and uh, slightly older technology uh, which is arm trust zone that is also around uh, for android devices so i will actually uh, briefly talk about uh, homomorphic encryption uh, this is actually um, a neat idea which uh, uh, which is to say that the problem with encryption is that you encrypt the data but uh, when you compute it you need to decrypt it and only then you can compute on it right uh, traditionally uh, you could not perform computations on encrypted data but homomorphic encryption uh is uh, uh, it's aim is to let you 
compute on encrypted data uh, without uh, ever decrypting it. So, which means that uh, since you never actually uh, decrypt the data, uh, you can only uh, you can only compute it in a given way. So, um, before going further, I mean, uh, if there are any questions uh, till this point, I can take them now. Anyone? Okay. So, all right. So, I'll briefly explain um, the concept behind homomorphic encryption. I won't explain um, secure multi party computation in garbage circuits because I think that becomes too complex um, and is probably not relevant. So, um, the idea of uh, computing without decrypting is this that, first of all, all computation uh, can be expressed as uh, plus and multiply. Just like all computation can be expressed as uh, uh, a bunch of NAND gates, you can think of all computation can be expressed as plus and uh, multiply. So now if you are able to uh, compute plus and multiply in an encrypted fashion, there is hope that you can compute everything in an encrypted fashion. So that's the idea. Uh, so uh, an encryption scheme is called additively homomorphic. If uh, uh, you know the plain text addition of A and B, if you try to encrypt that, that is equal to uh, some special addition of encryption of A and encryption of B. Uh, so this uh, right hand side is uh, happening in the safer text space where you are computing uh, the encryption of A plus B without actually ever decrypting A or B. You only, you are only operating on the cipher texts and you are applying this special plus operation on them um, to compute encryption of A and B. Right? Uh, and similarly, a multiplicative homomorphic scheme is where you can perform a multiplication of A cross B, A times B, uh, by performing a special kind of multiplication on the encryption of A and on the encryption of B. So you can imagine that in this way, if you uh, keep on uh, computing, uh, so you can express each computation as a circuit of plus and multiply, and you can keep on computing uh, cipher texts, essentially. Um, the encryption of any arbitrary expression or any arbitrary computation can be expressed by uh, these primitive uh, encrypted computations. Uh, and essentially, at the end of it, you will still get an encryption. So you don't know what uh, value you computed. And you give that and give the result out to the party uh, whom you want to present the answer. And uh, that party can probably decrypt it. So that is the rough idea of homomorphic encryption. Uh, the remote party who is performing the computation never gets to know the answer. Um, and uh, probably if it does, it only gets to know the answer of uh, uh, the final computation and not any intermediate things. Um, so uh, there is no uh, problem with leakage of intermediate data. Right? But the, the problem is that uh, designing an encryption scheme which uh, supports uh, either additive homomorphism or multiplicative homomorphism is easy, but designing something that satisfies both of them, that is both additively and multiplicatively homomorphic is actually quite challenging. And uh, such schemes uh, do exist. Uh, there was a recent breakthrough in 2009, um, but they are extremely slow, uh, means orders of magnitude slow. And uh, so uh, they are far from being practical. Uh, maybe in a few decades we will see something, but at least now uh, they are not a practical solution at all. Um, and finally, there is this problem of how do you 
convert uh, your regular com uh, computation to a circuit and uh, um, that itself has its own inefficiencies. So, uh, uh, I, yeah. I think I'll, I should add out there your, uh, your befouling homomorphic encryption and the homomorphic researchers will be angry. I think that in specific scenarios, homomorphic encryption can be used with great effect. For example, for electronic voting. Uh, so people have been able to tally votes in the uh, cipher space, in the encrypted space completely. And there are absolutely outstanding uh, electronic voting solutions based on homomorphic encryption. So there can be specific applications, but converting a general purpose computation to a homomorphic uh, solution uh, will require problem uh, re-engineering at a, at a scale that is not practical. Yes. Uh, with respect to voting, actually, I just wanted to point out that uh, that is a uh, special purpose application, which is solved only even if you have an additively homomorphic scheme. So you don't need this full homomorphic encryption where uh, the encryption scheme must be able to do both plus and multiply, right? So uh, yeah, some applications will turn out in such a way that they can be nicely done with just an additive homomorphic scheme or with just a, a multiplicative homomorphic scheme. But in general, uh, yeah, it's a very hard uh, conversion to do. Okay. There is a question in what scenarios should one be using additive or multiplicative homomorphic encryption? Um, that depends on problem to problem. For example, voting requires you to count votes. So that is naturally an addition of uh, votes by different individuals, right? Uh, so additive homomorphic scheme uh, fits naturally there. For a different problem, you may find uh, multiplicative homomorphic homomorphism is required. So that depends on the problem. On the issue of computing uh, time, right? Like you said, how this is very slow. I think it was to, up to the power of 10 power 12 compared to non-encryption analytics. If one is probably analyzing using homomorphic en encryption and it has been decreasing over the years. Uh, yes. So do you see an actual scenario where this is being going to be implemented uh, say on par with the uh, non-encrypted scenario and it's an added business cost, right? Especially for companies to invest in this. Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, it's uh, um, not an additional investment per se, but uh, actually there was a recent paper which talks about the cost of doing this in software, uh, like uh, using fully homomorphic encryption and doing this by buying special hardware, right? And it turns out that uh, the hardware solution uh, turns out to be uh, way cheaper than doing it in software. Um, considering the, um, the compute costs, um, so assuming that you are charged by the hour at Amazon EC2, uh, the costs uh, that you will incur by the software solutions are exorbitantly high. And uh, um, even though, yes, uh, techniques are emerging to uh, make the first uh, fully homomorphic scheme uh, practical, but uh, there are still um, the general consensus in the community is that these techniques are still way um, behind uh, in terms of any practical deployment. Maybe um, a decade away, at least. Um, so there is a friend of ours called Sheta, Sheta Agarwal. Uh, uh, if she heard this, she would have beaten you up. Uh, you know, she, she works on homomorphic encryption. That's her specialty. And uh, any active researcher in the domain will tell you just a few years. Just hang on. So I think that uh, the jury is out. Uh, this is an extremely promising area of work. And uh, one, uh, there are two issues out there. One is to do a fully general and you know, fully homomorphic encryption uh, fast. That is one aspect. The second aspect is not all computations are now naturally expressed in terms of homomorphic encryption. So there's a translation process in there. So any problem, so for example, if I'm doing sorting or searching or something, right, you know, some uh, SQL queries, there is a theorem which says that I can do it in the homomorphic space. 
but to actually convert it will be a lot of work and uh, how will you convert legacy applications or legacy algorithms into homomorphic thing is a, is a is an open question so there are two issues out there one is making homomorphic computation fast and second is making the translation practical and both both are open open questions right okay um any other questions uh i think that's it okay uh, so yeah now i will actually uh, go on to describe this uh, uh, intel sdx solution uh, which is the hardware uh, solution and it depends on a trusted hardware uh, and what uh, you do here is that you trust the uh, and hardware as has a special security module installed in the cpu let's say and what it does is it its job is to uh, treat a program as uh, an isolated box uh, your program is uh, um, put in an isolated box called an enclave and the job of this security module is to give you two guarantees the confidentiality guarantee and the integrity guarantee the confidentiality guarantee says that while the program is executing none of my intermediate state or the final state or whatever uh, is visible to anybody outside the enclave right and the integrity guarantee says that um, while i am executing nobody can actually tamper my execution um, midway so nobody can give me some uh, can change some arbitrary memory locations uh, and change my execution so together with these two uh, guarantees you achieve purpose limitation so if you uh, if you define you know the uh, if you want to make sure that uh, only this particular program should run so these two guarantees together uh, give you that guarantee right um, and the way uh, you know the security module works is um, and representing this in a very abstract way is that any request that comes uh, all requests first of all have to go through the security module which is uh, why it is part of the cpu package itself and if it is requesting uh, a part of memory which does not belong to the enclave then it is allowed but if it is an outside request and it uh, is trying to read the enclave memory then that is not allowed so this uh, gives you confidentiality similarly there is a similar approach for integrity uh, so this is a simple solution but uh, uh, it's also a very strong solution unless you have physical access to the box and uh, you can actually uh, break the box uh, it's very hard to uh, hard to break these guarantees and there's a slight catch uh, i'll come to that uh, later uh, but um, okay you get this um, confidentiality and integrity uh, you start Uh, the program you load the program in this enclave and then you are guaranteed that that's how it will run but uh, as a remote agent so you don't have this machine this is to be installed at uh, the data controller right how do you know uh, whether uh, they are running a given program so uh, that is uh, uh, that comes from this third um, basic property that it provides and that's called remote attestation so it is basically a signature mechanism so basically the hardware um, the trusted hardware which is the security module within the cpu that signs a statement which uh, uh, essentially means the following that this particular enclave contains this code x and its executions confidentiality and integrity will be protected by the hardware at run time and it signs it with uh, its own hardware key which is flushed in the hardware so nobody can read that key uh, and uh, you as the verifier you check whether uh, the signature comes from the right hardware uh, key and you check whether the code x which they are talking about is the right code that you expect 
and only then you send any of your sensitive data right so this ensures that um, any sensitive data will only be processed as per code x and not in any other way um so this uh, kind of gives you uh, a reasonable uh, solution practical solution to uh, this problem of uh, um, preventing computations uh, only allowing certain amount of certain type of computations uh, but there is a um, catch you need to be uh, aware about is that there's this thing called side channel attacks um which is that if you observe the memory access patterns um where the memory is being accessed and then you um, associate with that with the um, timing uh, of access and whether the cache is full or not these kind of things may reveal some information and um, there are some successful attacks uh, <coughs> which uh, um which basically um Uh, break this confidentiality guarantee but this is a very hard attack to do you have to be uh, first of all you need physical access on the machine you cannot do it remotely uh, second you also need to observe uh, these access patterns very carefully and it may not always work um, for for some kind of algorithms yes this attack may be uh, uh, possible attack uh, but not for all uh, but this is something yes you should be uh, worried about and uh, there is research uh, going on to uh, give you intel sdx like guarantees uh, um, but also protection against side channel attacks uh, so people uh, have proposed other hardware and um, which protects against some of these things uh, but uh, what i want to convey is that this is an active uh, um area uh, of research um, and this is a good a reasonably good uh, practical solutions today um sdx is available in most of uh, um, the modern laptops most of the uh, modern macbook pros have uh, sdx nowadays uh, the desktops uh, have sdx uh, and uh, the equivalent of this which is uh, arm trust zone which was actually a predecessor of this is also present in uh, mobile phones uh, the android phones at least so that's something uh, which gives you this purpose uh, limitation kind of guarantee uh, so uh, if there are any questions um, on intel sdx i would like to take that now um then i'll quickly wrap up with uh, one or two slides do you have any industry applications that are already happening on this um so um, yeah actually uh, no i we are mostly used for uh, um uh, digital write management uh, drm uh, thing also apple uses them for uh, ensuring that you are paid for all the apple software and only the real versions are running so sgx primarily uses limited to that for database applications there is a great uh, application called an enclave db from microsoft where they show um, extremely high performance databases can be put into um entirely can be run under sgx environment and uh, i can see my my colleague from my department riju is on the um, you know is one of the listeners she is an absolute expert on sgx and especially trust zone arm trust zone and uh, specializes in it maybe she can throw some light and uh, um yeah i think uh, uh, both of them uh, because uh, uh, there are attacks still going on especially on the side channel uh so um, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, these things are not open for programming for the normal people so people give out uh, you will see sgx is present on your laptop but you are not able to run a program in an enclave or create an enclave you might uh, 
similarly from ARM Trust Zone. So all our phones are Trust Zone enabled. So the chip supports it, but it, you cannot run a secure program. So this is essentially for security that these companies like Samsung and all these companies, they say that we will we have a secure chip, but it is not open for programming. So uh, it's uh, so the use is sort of limited because there is there are very few people with access to these things who can program it. So Samsung makes something called a Knox. Um, Intel itself or Microsoft, who has some collaboration with Intel machines, they can uh, have their uh, Enclave DB. So it it create has created a sort of an ecosystem where some people have access to these uh, devices. But uh, definitely they are showing more and more capability. So it will become open for more people. Uh, but um, as of the normal, like uh, any app developer, if they want to use the Trust Zone, uh, they will probably have to use a dev kit. Uh, which is not really a phone, but really an open kind of a phone, which has all these wires coming out and stuff. So uh, yeah, there is some platform issue at, still at the moment. Uh, I think Prashant, you can move ahead. I think there okay. are no more questions. All right. Um, so this last point I want to uh, bring out is that um, SDX takes care of uh, your computation, but uh, essentially you also need the database uh, really where, uh, where you store uh, data and uh, where uh, the SDX or whatever uh, remote execution mechanism interacts with. Um, so there are really, uh, you can think about this space in uh, two um, disjoint branches. Uh, first is that uh, you have an encrypted database and you want to query it. And that itself is uh, quite a challenging problem. Uh, and uh, there has been research on uh, specially designed searchable encryption schemes. Um, and uh, these uh, searchable indices along with encrypted data. What uh, means is that you have encrypted data, but for uh, the purpose of searching, you add a certain index. Uh, and that index structure um, may just uh, be useful for searching, uh, but it does not reveal uh, a lot of information about the encrypted data itself. Uh, as a quick example, um, for example, you want to, um, let's say, search for um, everybody with uh, everybody by uh, their name, right? So you want exact equality testing. What you can do is you can add an index. So you have uh, everybody's name in an encrypted format, but next to it, you can add an index, which, um, which just is a, a hash of the name. So uh, somebody uh, who looks at the hash does not know what uh, name you are talking about, but it, uh, it lets you search. Uh, so when you search, you search using the hash of the name and that will give you, um, that will fetch the record, the correct record, which you can decrypt uh, and, uh, and use it. Uh, the problem with this kind of uh, technique is first, it is uh, not very um, flexible. So for example, what if you want to do, uh, you know, uh, ordering? So give me all records greater who, whose age is uh, greater than 18, right? Uh, so how do you do that uh, with an index? So there are these order preserving encryption and all that. Uh, the point is that as you keep on adding more and more capability to the indices, uh, the, index, the indices themselves start uh, containing information about the encrypted stuff. So all these uh, reconstruction attacks that we talked about earlier, many of those attacks are possible and have been demonstrated on the searchable indices also. Uh, and this is a problem, uh, which is why uh, I think this uh, solution of uh, um, Enclave DB, which uh, uh, referred to earlier, uh, where you put the entire database within an Enclave. Uh, that may be a good solution, uh, but 
yes, there are uh, practicality constraints with that as well. How do you put the entire database within an enclave? How efficient that is? So all those things are uh, current uh, questions which people are actively trying to solve. Uh, but this, I believe, is a good direction to go in. Uh, there's another um, field called uh, private information retrieval. Uh, but I think that this, uh, the concern of this field is different. Um, here, the database itself is in plain text. It may be some public database. Uh, and you are querying uh, that public database. But you are only concerned with the fact that uh, whoever is responding should not know which uh, data items you actually queried. So it hides the access patterns, uh, but the database itself is uh, in the clear. So uh, I think with respect to the privacy question, this may not be very relevant to us, uh, but uh, I just put it there for completeness. <laughs> so uh, this is actually now my last slide. Uh, essentially, uh, you know that uh, you have hopefully been convinced that Privacy is a, a complex problem. It requires a multi-pronged approach. You can't just, you don't have a single silver bullet. It solves everything. Um, and there are many techniques which exist for each, but you need kind of an architecture or design uh, set of uh, design principles, uh, and a set of operational design principles uh, to give you the privacy guarantee, which is well aligned with the legal principles of privacy. Uh, and this is something which uh, we will talk about in the next session. Um, so um, so we uh, I have hopefully uh, established that uh, purpose limitation is this crucial privacy requirement, uh, especially considering uh, this impossibility of absolute privacy. So you uh, only can protect uh, what uh, processing uh, is allowed. And, uh, and that is something uh, which, uh, where you know, the computer science research is uh, preliminary at best. And I think that's where uh, we should spend more time on. Um, so the uh, other two points basically will be covered in tomorrow's talk. Um, more elaborately, basically there is no uh, technique which talks about an external regulator which uh, decides uh, what is legal processing and what is illegal processing, what is legal or illegal access um, and controls it and actively controls it. Uh, so we give uh, a broad um, high level architecture and design architecture um, to do that. And also, uh, there's this question of uh, consent and uh, how much individuals uh, themselves should manage their own privacy and what is the role of regulator. Um, that is also something we will bring out in uh, tomorrow's talk. Um, so I think with that, uh, I would like to finish. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to take now. <laughs> Thanks, Prashant. Uh, if anyone has any open-ended questions on any of these topics, or if you're confused about anything, please just go ahead and ask. But ideally, I would say, just say you're going to unlock your mic on the chat so that you're doing it one by one. There is a larger uh, problem uh, with the, but with just not the techniques, but about the implementation. Okay, yeah. um, and uh, that problem is why industry. Uh, so you you ask. So here is the here is my industry opinion. Okay, uh, historically all the teams struggle in order to just deliver what is required for the business. Okay, and there is always a competing element of time. Uh, in a sense that you only have X developers and your list of things to do is 2X developer time. 
and so where is the time and bandwidth and energy to do research to figure out how to implement zkp prop i mean you forget zkp uh, we have historically found our teams even struggling to do bcrypt uh, and put md5 checksums on open lan and uh, this is this has been going on for such a long time that it is it is it is imperative for us to go back and say that uh, what is the capacity building that we are doing on industry side in order to ensure that they get these implementations right i think that is where the problem is going to be not on the theoretical constructs mm. yes because what because what is going to happen is um, i mean the, these are all very nice sounding stuff okay and uh, i know it doesn't take a lot of time but the problem is the amount of research that has gone into my head is like very high um, so i kind of know how to do it but how do you build the capacity in every company i mean that is the hard uh, technological it is not a technological problem it's basically a bureaucratic slash organizational problem and until you don't do that uh, any amount of regulation that you write on the policy side uh, would be met with yeah it is too hard and then plain lying that's basically how i look at it yeah can i can i uh, respond to that uh, yeah i would agree i think that uh, you know uh, capacity is uh, capacity is always a problem um but uh, you know i think that we are restricting ourselves uh, in this paper primarily to large national scale databases and if okay. you are pulling out say something like um, aadhaar for example or a public credit registry or uh, pulling out uh, national health record system you know as disha uh, app then the privacy protection demands shoot up i think that uh, you know a company doing this with a limited data uh, where you have got a uh, you know special special purpose uh, engagement is different from a national level mandatory application like uh, some of some of uh, some of the those that we are seeing in these days i think that the privacy protection demands in those application require techniques which are far more sophisticated than what we have what we have seen and uh, some of these are difficult to implement you know zkp may not be because zkp has standard libraries uh, for many many simple zkp applications but some of those techniques like an enclave db or so on and so forth is will be very hard to implement yes but i think that the capacity will have to be built if you are trying to do something at a large scale and which is probably one of the reasons like no no country has done an electronic health record no country has done a digital identity right so when you put them to scrutiny almost all countries are backed up of, of such a thing so except a small country like estonia uh, nobody else has really a you know electronic voting system or electronic digital identity system and so on so forth but but if you if you try to build computer science into public life then you will not be able to live its uh, rigor behind i think that you have to also bring the rigor into public life um, and the state diversity question will have to be somehow answered so now i'll ask a different question i mean so here is where it is i mean i completely agree what you're saying the only question i'm seeing is that look let's not just stop with the theory i mean this is probably the first time we have it so it's okay but i'm just seeing on a broader level as we keep working on it we really really get down to implementation uh, question prototypes and how to do it kind of a guides and i think that is really what we are really looking at yes uh, i th- i think that prashant is not getting his phd without that so okay. he have to implement uh, some of it because uh, you know mo- moment he tries to publish in computer science the first question that he will face is the question that you are asking bhaiya yeah, where is the implementation uh, you know i think there is a challenge i think that uh, while uh, an implementation is uh, feasible we can do it and we'll have to do it i am at my wits end as to how to test it you know uh, at what scale where do i test such a thing you know just building a you know putting it together is probably something that we can do uh, i think that we need a lot more brainstorming around that you know how to how to, even if you do a pilot how do we test it how do we populate it and um, how do we uh, stress test it figure out you know performance stress testing is one aspect but uh, privacy stress testing is a completely different ball game 
So yeah. those are those are open questions. Yeah, I don't and, know. And yeah, so there is also the other negative side testing, which is kind of easy because I mean I noticed today's participants, a lot of people said, "What de anonymization doesn't work." Uh, I mean, it's it is not a big deal for me because we have been doing it for a very long time. But so what we have to probably do is we have to do a lot of uh, proof for it because yeah. it's fundament. It can't be like your statement versus my statement and some other statement saying anonymization works. You need to write a lot of proofs with public data. Uh, some of it is doable because the Wahan database uh, is available uh, if only you know where to look for it. Uh, you can just look at it and then basically figure out a lot from people. I mean, it's quite possible for you to take a small data set like that and prove your point uh, rather than getting into the debate of, I mean, is it even... Uh, on that anonymization question, the Princeton group, especially Arvind Narayanan's group, uh, they have demonstrated it uh, beyond all doubt. You know, they, they have been doing it, uh, privacy attacks on anonymized data sets. And they have done on all kinds of things. And their latest review paper, I think that one that is quoted out here. Prashant, if you show the next slide, you have the references. Uh, um, I think that Narayanan et al. 2019 uh, pretty much settles the debate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then, I mean, we know how we our country is now. Uh, so we, we should, uh, it's all Atman and Rabar. We have to do it somewhere internally. So I'm just saying, just as a proof point, I, I mean, in my mind, the debate is settled on de-anonymization, but not on a lot of people's mind. And we are on the forefront of the technology edge. It's very uh, unsympathetic of us to expect that other people understand the same things as what we do. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree. There, there are issues out there, yeah. I guess this is that effort and we will continue to do that. But anyone else has any more questions in particularly about these techniques or even about the paper? I guess we have all of the people. Yes, so Siddharth has a question. Siddharth, can you unmute yourself and speak? Yeah, I, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, uh, so my question was uh, about, I guess, tailoring the data for uh, specific purposes. And uh, you've covered this already, but in the sense that uh, you, you covered the methods, but I was also wondering, I mean, I'd appreciate if you would talk about it a bit more, but also I was wondering how you kind of perceive that role, uh, the role of, uh, I guess, uh, tailoring either the access control or tailoring the data itself uh, for specific purposes. Uh, because I, I'm imagining this to be a, a kind of function which not only uh, has the technical capacity of how to kind of manipulate this data or or how it needs to be kind of uh, modified but also doing that according to how the data is going to be used right which is more i guess on the application side of it in that sense so i was wondering how you kind of think about that role or think about how that would work um so i think you uh, uh, you don't tailor the data per se um, but rather you uh, you specify uh, how this data can be processed, right? And the concerns that you need to, uh, what you need to be concerned is whether uh, what you are allowing to process is legal or not, essentially. And that's where uh, we will talk about it maybe tomorrow some more. Uh, an external regulator comes into picture. And this, uh, the job of this external regulator is to ensure that whatever is allowed is legal. Uh, in terms of uh, whether whatever data you are processing is necessary for uh, the purpose you uh, for the legitimate purpose uh, that you have stated or uh, for example if uh, uh, the state is collecting uh, um, you know your bluetooth tokens for um, covid contact tracing then uh, how they are using it uh, are they actually just uh, um, using it for identifying the intersections or they are doing something else. So that is something which is more of a policy question and uh, less of uh, the application um, question. And this is just Malavika here. I mean, just to quickly add in and maybe this will come up uh, tomorrow as well. I think part of this, uh, why the you know, the role of different actors, even within a secure execution um, remote environment, also needs to somewhere be twinned into what we all agree regarding some of these things that uh, Prashant mentioned, even in terms of the privacy risk assessment, for instance, and the types of data right. and how you react right. to that. 
and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Uh, I hope that answers your question to that. Uh, Suhan Mukherjee has a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think uh, what I wanted to look at was uh, essentially being a lawyer, looking at the legal system and how that's architected and the techniques that you're talking about and the architecture on the technology side. Then from a regulatory perspective, what has now come out, uh, you know, as the, say, the Sri Krishna report and then the draft bill uh, and the bill which is introduced in parliament, uh, in a sense, it tends to be that the AP Shah approach of principles and architecting that uh, with a regulator uh, that intervenes on a context-driven framework is, uh, with bright lines in terms of outcomes is uh, uh, perhaps a better approach because the techniques that you would apply from a technology perspective would keep changing uh, or you would keep improving or testing. Uh, and the principle is what the regulator would be applying or, or changing. And it also then ensures there's a dynamism in the public policy regulatory space uh, which matches what the changes in technology techniques, uh, etc. So, any comments uh, on that? Uh, right. So, uh, the, uh, the, let these Malavika, ish Mal let Malvika go first. And then. <laughs> You're putting me in the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> this is definitely, uh, Prashant has the floor on this one. Um, I think what is, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly biased, but uh, unlike the data that there's such a system will be dealing with i think the, i mean overall a simple answer to that is i think uh, the principles are something that can that must be updated from time to time and they i think the benefit of having a system like this is that those principles and where we land on say biometric data or genetic data or a lot of these questions is where we'll have to land having a conversation together as a society right and that's hopefully the role that this new regulator will play um, but I think the idea that they cannot then quickly update data processing uh, uh, by everybody in the ecosystem in line with the principle we agreed, that implementation problem where we fall down, I think that's what I hope that an approach like this will help solve. Uh, because it's very much if we all agree tomorrow that, you know, actually we don't agree that genetic data should be added to, say, say, a national unique identification database. It could very well be a conversation that arises in our society. The minute the regulator agrees yes or no, we could quickly hard code it into, I wouldn't say hard code, but uh, we could translate that into a situation where we actually ensure that no one is doing that outside of a particular enclave. I don't know if that helps answer the question. Uh, and Prashant and Subhashri and um, Subodh, back to you, actually. I think Prashant can add on. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to add that, um, yes, if you later on uh, uh, change the principles uh, uh, with respect to what's uh, um, legal and what's not, um, that requires the regulator to take an active uh, dynamic role in uh, all this uh, uh, control of uh, data processing. And that must be part of uh, the um, architecture. And we will talk about this uh, tomorrow. I'll, I'll answer it a little differently. You know, I'll say that uh, if you look at a uh, you know, data protection standard like the GDPR, the draft data protection bill, um, it is not operational at all. You know, it is uh, a generic set of guidelines. And uh, while that is fine, you know, while that gives you flexibility to bring in different techniques and so on and so forth, I think uh, without going and getting into specific technique, there's a need for operationalization. And uh, the need is as follows, that if you, if you don't operationalize at all, any time you're trying to, say, evaluate something like proportionality, you know, you have to do a balancing. And uh, so you've got a utility argument from somewhere, and now you have to balance it against the privacy laws. But without, without finding out the limits of the privacy laws or without, you know, not necessarily quantifying it, but without characterizing the privacy laws in more concrete terms, I think that all proportionality arguments will run into random uh, outcomes. Like, for example, in the Aadhaar judgment, you know, some judges went this way, some judges went that way. So 
part of the problem is that that when you talk about privacy uh, to the judgment uh, also perhaps some of the arguments there was no standard to which the privacy uh, uh, was held so you have to define some kind of a standard and i think that that's where we are coming in we are not coming in with this implementation right now but but our endeavor is to you know to set as set a benchmark for the privacy so these are the kind of things you have to do for data minimization uh, whether it is this technique or that technique or so on so forth but uh, this is what you have to do for purpose this is what you have to do for access control so i think that the endeavor right now in this paper is to set those standards and define them and characterize them a little more crisply than what is available in say a data protection act yeah i i agree and that's why i asked the question because for me uh, hearing this conversation as well as whatever other reading i've done uh, i feel uh, the model doesn't actually support this sort of an approach which i think is actually extremely uh, useful for a country like ours given that we've been able to benefit from the history of looking what's happened for the past 20 years or more in other jurisdictions and we've kind of gone and straight jacketed the regulatory architecture using that old design rather than taking advantage of things like what you all have discussed over here and framing it uh, in the same manner i think our space and atomic regulation sectors are where we could take the lesson out of for uh, this because it stayed dynamic with the folks uh, and what they're doing in the technology sector uh, and regulation matches or follows the tech piece and uh, i think we haven't done that in the privacy piece in the way that it's currently structured so yeah thank you actually thank you just on that, that. Uh, if i can just add a quick thought because obviously we're following the uh, sorry i just go a little bit i just mute if that's okay so han yeah i mean i i get your question now i mean one thing that i feel is important to note is we think that this model could actually fit within even the current pdp bills vision because uh, we did a i mean we i mean vara research had uh, done a policy brief looking at how you would implement what the pdp bill is trying to do in terms of secondary regulation and it seems like on many of the big picture items that we are talking about here you know in relation to uh, security safeguards and so on it's the it, it says we should have them but a future dpa will say what it is kind of thing so hopefully you know this kind of dynamic approach even though it seems to be straight jacketing and like setting up a regulator that will do x y and z i think the detail of that hasn't been fulfilled uh, full filled out in the statutory legislation which i think is good and i do think there's an opportunity if we have models like this out there to actually you know show what is possible to that regulator in the next and I, i'm hoping it will take at least a year or two before they start you know writing very granular rules and in that uh, time i think this is the kind of work that could be done to actually help the regulator pass those codes that they are supposed to be passing on many of these subjects if that helps yeah, and i i completely agree uh, with what you're saying in terms of uh, what your the the approach that you all have taken is fantastic i am just concerned that uh, just looking at the way the regulator has been structured and how regulators have tended to work uh, i feel there may end up being a disconnect in the way that you all are suggesting how things should go and i and if you ask me i do believe that you all are going down the right path uh, and uh, the regulator will not be able to you know appreciate that nuance or the or the regulatory system in the way that it's being architected may not be able to achieve that nuance given that there's firstly a limitation on it just being for personal data and not looking at data in general uh, across the board because i think we need to look at data uh, uh, in a broader context than just legal definitions of what is personal data etc the second is that if you don't give it a commission type of structure with the powers it will not have the ability to dynamically dictate or put out there a standards what you are saying uh, should be you know basis what research you all do and you know your i mean but that's just a concern that uh, i have just as a response yes, so to i com what i completely saying. agree you know we have been a little wild out here and um, you know there are there are several problems that i see like what anand said about capacity building you know capacity is a big problem um, 
regulatory capacity is what you are talking about is is again a big problem but the regulator sees that this is the fit job for a regulator is also a problem i think that uh, you know our objective out here is to conceptualize uh, conceptualize privacy protection in in certain terms and lay out that if privacy is indeed a wish list is on the wish list then there are certain necessary things necessary conditions i think that uh, prashant tried to say those and we will uh, come back to it tomorrow we will also try to argue that there are certain sufficient conditions right so there are um, there are certain uh, there are, there are some things that you need to do maybe not in the form that we are suggesting but in some form those things will have to be done if your privacy privacy wish list have to be satisfied so so i think that we are more in the idea space here than suggesting specific solution out here so we are saying that any architecture that you do will have to look something like this will have to have these ingredients yeah no i i think you should submit i mean push really to have uh, the ministry of it uh, you know uh, buy into the approach before uh, they kind of really push the bill as it is through uh, because i think your uh, your approach will serve us better in the long run That's in my personal right. opinion <laughs> yeah Okay, I, I I see one last question from Sanjeeva Prasad. Uh, I don't know if he has a question or if he has uh, he has something to say, but please go ahead. More a comment, uh, and I was sort of interested to hear voices from both the legal world and from the industry world talking about proof. I'm a formalist, and one of the things I think you know, if I'm I don't think I'm on Prashant's evaluation committee, but. one of the things i would like to see him do and this is sort of uh, uh, gets quite interesting is to use notions of you know knowledge based proofs and so the zero knowledge work comes out of a very uh, sort of uh, rich tradition of knowledge based proofs of correctness of such protocols so um, so you know for example there were questions about what is a hash function how, you know why can't i use a hash function and how is it different from encryption and all a lot of these get actually quite clear when you start of start formalizing their you know what they achieve in uh, some kind of formalism which is a uh, logic based formalism and some of that also ties up very well with l- the legal world you know there's a bunch of people who have done some nice textbook work on how laws which affect people can be rendered in some kind of computational logic uh, and uh, they again you know tie up quite nicely so i found it interesting that there is this concern and so the question of whether the law really conforms to this or whether a piece of technology is uh, conforms to the conforms to the law can possibly be answered going by this very computer science N- uh, logician nerdy way of thinking but it, it's just a possibility that intrigues me so sanjeev are you suggesting a language based approach right uh, well uh, no one is that i, I think what prashant hasn't actually uh, talked about entirely is language based security which yeah. is something yeah, I yeah. yeah? I, I uh, that's a different that's a different approach that is where you start uh, in your computational language itself you start having things like type systems which uh, start saying how can this piece of data be used how can it be accessed how can it be passed on can i delegate authority to uh, yeah prashant will have uh, to get into type systems yeah yeah, I, yeah that's a different thing i i think uh, it's it's a rabbit hole which i don't know if it, he needs to do at this stage but i think just this business of is this piece common knowledge so one of the things for example which i always find very you know difficult to convince people is that something need not be a secret but it doesn't mean it should be common knowledge and this is a very uh, you know a bad leap that uh, technologists make say so, oh it's not secret so i can just publish it you know so things of this kind uh, you know so i say well your your uh, your fingerprints are not secret but that doesn't mean that they should be on a public database for everyone or your 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 uh, your uh, iris scan is not clear it should be available to anybody in the in the country who wants to see your iris scan so these are things which i think uh, lawyers i think will understand quite intuitively uh, so you know things like common knowledge and uh, i know that you know that 
he knows that you know that and so on. These are quite interesting frameworks to play with. Yeah. Okay, then Malvika, you go tomorrow first, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it might be Anubhuti. She's also at this call. <laughs> okay. I, 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 yeah, I just wanted to quickly just add that I thought that that's a very powerful framing. And actually, there is this entire a few universities in the world have kind of uh, in, interestingly logic based AI research where they, they, they try and go back to like the logic based underpinnings of legal regulation. And then they're also using that. So, I mean, I entirely agree. I, I wish we could shift to that kind of framing because Sajiva, in many ways... Sajiva would, Sajiva would absolutely love it, right? Uh, saying that. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we're not, it's not leagues apart. I think any discipline which has logic as its underpinning. And that, that's why I think somebody like Amartya Sen does such great work because he's working back from economics down to logic, right? And so you're also able to legally access his work. Uh, but I, I'll stop, I'll stop... Uh, you know, being stratospheric about it. But just thank you for saying that is what I want. Okay. On that note, we'll end it here. I'll see you all tomorrow. I'll send you the slides in an email and also send you the link for tomorrow. Uh, it's ideally the same, the one we are right now. Uh, it won't change, but I'll just send you one more email reminder mail tomorrow. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shimi.